Hello, everyone. And my name is Xia Li Yang. Welcome to annual Ibsen Lecture. 2020 has been a special and strange year for many of us. The pandemic makes us, uh, makes clear once again that many unresolved problems that humanities face are still prevalent. And we need to understand how our decisions about whose life matters will shape the future of our world. In our global community, it is ever more important to work collaboratively to identify key issues and creatively explore ways to promote social and political change. Theater allows us to do exactly that. And Ibsen's texts, as we know, have been reimagined again and again in a world where legacies of colonization, imperialism, and slavery are still largely present. Over the years, the Center for Ibsen Studies has made an effort to document and study the rich repertoire of Ibsen adaptations around the world and continuously push the boundary of Ibsen studies to include more voices and perspectives. We still have a long way to go. Therefore, the topic of this year's annual Ibsen lecture is decolonizing Ibsen, providing a framework for us to share our experiences and discuss the relationship between Ibsen's works and decolonization. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our guests of honor this year. Dr. Robert, Robert Malcolm McLaren, whose professional name is Robert Mshengu Kavanaugh, and Professor Sabiha Haq. <laughs> Dr. McLaren is a fourth generation South African of Scottish descent. He was born in Durban, educated in Natal, and currently lives in Zimbabwe. Dr. McLaren is an arts educator and theater academic, practitioner and writer in South Africa, Ethiopia, and Zimbabwe. He was a co-founder of Chipao, Children's Performing Arts Workshop in Zimbabwe and later directed Chipao World, which was awarded an Ibsen scholarship in 2011 for its project, Negotiating Ibsen in Southern Africa. Dr. McLaren has adapted Ibsen's Pirkind and A Doll's House in the Zimbabwean context. We will learn more about that later today. Professor Huck is Professor of English at Kuna University, Bangladesh. She received her doctoral degree from the Center for Ibsen Studies in 2014. Professor Huck is a member of the International Ibsen Committee. She is currently working on decolonized urban theater spaces in sub South Asian countries and the use of Ibsen in the decolonizing process. We will hear more about her latest project today. More detailed introduction of Dr. McLaren and Professor Huck can be found on the event page at uio.no. Welcome Dr. McLaren and Professor Huck. We are very pleased that you both said yes to my request to be this year's guests of honor. To start our discussion, I would like to ask Dr. McLaren, as a prolific writer in theater and politics and an African theater maker, what is your take on theater and decolonization? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Liang, and hello everybody. Uh, the last time I was in Norway, uh, that was for the International Ibsen Conference. It may be silly to start like that because we're not in Norway, but it feels very much like we're in Norway. So let me say that. Um, we, uh, we ended up our presentation with a song. I would like uh, very much to introduce myself with that song. I like the song because no matter how much we differ or wherever we are or whatever we do, this is our planet and we are the human race. Better look after the planet and better look after each other. Now I'm going to sing it first in Zulu, then in Shona, and lastly in English. And I hope that when I sing it in English, 
uh, we'll all join in. It'll be really great if all over the place uh, we will have people singing the words of this song. Okay, so it starts like this. Ah, si bamba ne, si be moya munye, sa kum chaba we tu, si fana ne na majuba, gati batane, ti be moya munye, ti va keni kaye du, ti fana ne njiva. Now the English come. Let's go together. Let us come together and be of single spirit. Let us build our world just like turtle doves. Thank you very much. Did some of you sing? I heard you. That was great. Right, first of all, I think I need to say that as an African, I will approach this colloquialism from an African perspective. That having been said, I also need to say that as an African, sharing the stage with someone like Sabia Hook is not only a privilege, but it is an aspect of global uh, decolonization, which is what we're talking about. The tendency to talk about post-colonial this and post-colonial that uh, needs to be challenged. Uh, colonialism is a, a, a leopard that simply changes or, or changes its spots. Colonialism simply became neo-colonialism. And if the colony makes a move towards what Chinwezu referred to as liberation or sovereignty, the next phase is war. I want to share an anecdote with you. Uh, Caetano's minister of the overseas territories, I'm sure you remember Caetano, the dictator in Portugal, uh, during a, a panel discussion, somebody said, now that the colonial war is over, and this minister jumped to his feet, ex-minister jumped to his feet and said, what makes you think the colonial war is over? The colonial war is not over. In Zimbabwe, we are in a state of war. Crippling sanctions, negative publicity, constant interference and destabilization, funding for regime change. Yeah. You ask me what I see as decolonization. To end this cycle is what I see as decolonization. One of the symptoms and indeed the means of maintaining colonial relations after political independence are the hegemonic channels of communication between the West and the former uh, colonies, which serve as conduits of ideology, information, political perspectives, and culture, which they dominate. This includes theater. The deconstruction of this domination is a basic requirement for decolonization. We, uh, in the colonized world, need to set up alternative communication channels among ourselves, both in Africa and with others in the world who share our interests. For me, therefore, this opportunity to interact and exchange experiences and ideas with Sabiha is a very good way to begin talking about decolonizing Ibsen. Secondly, I feel I need to deconstruct, if not decolonize, but deconstruct myself. Uh, I've been asked uh, to talk about my, my work with Gibson. I want to explain that I have no such work. I started doing theater, making plays sometimes back, sometime back in this 1970, perhaps. Before that, I acted in in school and Cape Town University, Oxford University, where I was. But there's not a single play that I can call my, my own, my work. You see, for me as an artist, as a person who makes plays, people have such good ideas. So when I work in theater, their lives are so fascinating, their perspectives, much more than my own. So when I work in the theater, what I try to do is to bring out all this in others. And I always feel that the wonderful play we make 
if there are 12 people involved, I always feel that the wonderful play we make is 12 times better than it would have been if I tried to do it by myself. So I shall not be talking about my work. I should be talking about our work with Ibsen. I should say that in Africa, whilst almost everybody knows the name Norway, uh, I don't think anybody knows or very few people know anything about Ibsen. You know, Africa is living its daily life in a blissful but dangerous state of ignorance when it comes to things people in the West think are important. We're becoming ignorant about everything in the West except the globalized culture, largely from the US of films, music, dress and celebs. Yet the West has us by the throat. Talking of explo exploitation and colonization, though Denmark built slave castles on the West Coast of Africa, to my knowledge, I don't think Norway did. Besides, my history books tell me that until quite recently, Norway itself was a colony, only regaining its uh, independence in 1905. But that doesn't mean to say it was never a colonial power. It was last a colonial power during the time of the Vikings, settling and ruling the Western Isles in the north of Scotland. In fact, I might even have some Norwegian blood in me, given the fact that my family, the clan McLaren, came from the highlands of Scotland. And between you and me, I just can't wait for Scotland to be a nation again. And this history seems to have shaped African-Norwegian relations. Of all the international partners we have dealt with, and we've dealt with a lot in Chipao uh, with our various productions and working with children, Norway seemed to be the most disinterested. Now, don't mix up uninterested and disinterested. They were very interested. They seemed to understand what we were doing and support us. So when, Chipa when we worked together on the plays of Ibsen, uh, we with, uh, say, for instance, we were supported by the Norwegian embassy. Uh, we, we could do what we like. They just supported us. However, I need to say, to add that uh, during the colonial war, it, Norway uh, sided with us, supported us. Um, during the period of neocolonialism, she worked with us. But when the third phase of colonial war broke out in Zimbabwe, Norway left us. Thank you, Robert. That was a very enlightening, interesting uh, take on Ibsen and uh, decolonization. Now I want to ask Sabiha the same question. Um, I know your research expands over many fields. And as an Ibsen scholar, however, your works have focused primarily on the use of Ibsen in South Asia in different post-colonial contexts. What do you think the role Ibsen has played or Ibsen adaptations have played in those contexts? So Biha, you have to unmute yourself first. Sorry, thank you, Lian, for introducing me and Thank you, Dr. McLaren, for your way of setting the tone of today's conversation. Uh, I wish I could sing like you, but uh, I think I, I should continue with what I can do. Uh, to answer your question, Liang, and to come to the post-colonial juncture where Ibsen intervened in the Indian theater scene, I have a few points to highlight, and I will need my PowerPoint for that. <clears throat> so I would like to talk about uh, the origin of drama in the Indian subcontinent first. And as we, many of us know that Indian theater is one of the most ancient forms of theater. It is basically defined by the concept of Natya, which is a Sanskrit word for drama, but encompasses dramatic narrative dance and music. Indian theater emerged in the 15th century BC. Some say even before that. The visual here 
Uh, I have a few uh, visuals, uh, Liang. Uh, could you please go to that? The visual here will give you a clear idea that classical drama, apart from its Gipinatya or the song and dance elements, was necessarily about mass enactment. And the Vedic texts provide evidences of plays being enacted during the Hindu rituals performed in front of a sacred fire. Here we have Udaigiri and Khandagiri caves in Bhubaneshwar uh, from the second century BC. These are the earliest examples of theater architecture in India. And the Natya Shastra dated between 200 BC and 200 CE attributed to the sage Bharata Muni is a notable ancient encyclopedic treatise on arts, one which has influenced dance, music, and literary traditions in India. In Natya Shastra, Bharata refers to rasas, the nine human emotions that are crafted into a dramatic work to be relished by a sensitive spectator. I will eventually come to talk about how this quintessentially Indian aesthetic has been amalgamated into Ibsenism to produce plays that focus on the Indian situation in a post-colonial frame. But then uh, my next point is the decline of theater and I will focus on the Mughal period. Uh, the Mughals who ruled roughly from 16th to 19th centuries were lovers of arts and architecture, undoubtedly, but for some reason, they never patronized theater. Music and poetry flourished, but not theater. And theater, especially connected with religious occasions, continued in ancient forms in the unoccupied territories or in the margins. There was no urban theater as such that is recorded in historiography. And then I will come to this point of the beginning of modern urban theater in India. There is a history of modern urban theater in India of more than 200 uh, or more years. And Bengal had the pioneers in introducing this kind of urban theater performances. In 1795, a Bengali theater house in Calcutta presented its first Bengali play through the initiative of the Russian Indologist G.S. Lebedev. It was a Bengali translation of a comedy uh, titled The Disguise by Richard Paul Jodrell. And as the first urban theaters in the colonial period began in the hands of the British colonizers who wanted entertainment through staging English plays mostly. This Bengali play was an opening for the natives, starting with the apparently innocent act of entertainment, theater became a tool for anti-colonial resistance. Around 1858 and 1859, with the staging of Neil Dorpon, the, the slide you just had, Liang, uh, a Bengali play written by Dinobonthu Mitro, the anti-colonial stand of the Bengali cultural activists became clear. The play was connected to the Indigo revolt of 1859 in Bengal, when farmers refused to sow indigo in their fields to protest exploitative farming under the British Raj. At a time, I'm talking about the present moment, when global media is abuzz with news of farmers' protest in India, the post-colonial spectrum assumes new dimensions. Mitra's Nildarpon idealizes the kinship between the peasants and their feudal lords, unifying them against their common enemy, the white colonizer. It was also essential to the development of theater in Bengal and influenced Dirish Chandra Ghosh who in 1872 would establish the National Theater in Calcutta. It was, this play was translated by Michael Modushudan Dotto 
and it was published by Reverend James Long, this English man, for which he was sentenced to prison, charged with sedition. And then I will come to the beginning of first uh, professional theater houses in the Bengal province. Star and Minerva theaters in Kolkata. You have the slides there, Liam, of Star and Minerva. Uh, these were built respectively in 1883 and 1893. These were the places where the first motion pictures in Bengal made by Hira Lal Shen was, were screened. On the other hand, these were also the first institutions of commercial Bengali theater. Girish Chandra Ghosh was one of the first to produce plays at the Star Theater in the 80, 1880s. And finally, I will come to this Indian People's Theater Association or IPTA, which is the oldest association of theater artists in India. It was formed on 25th May, 1943 at the National Conference of Theater Artists held at the Marwari School, Bombay, which is Mumbai now, in response to the need for theater artists to become part of the Indian freedom struggle. Society of Performing Artists formed at communist initiative in quote unquote, defense of culture against fascism and imperialism in the organization's own words and to make art, I quote again, at once the expression and organizer of our people's struggle for freedom, cultural progress, and economic justice. Well, naturally, it promotes themes related to the Indian freedom struggle with a goal to bring cultural awakening among the people of India. For some time to come, therefore, and a time that witnessed the cataclysmic partition of the Indian subcontinent inseparably dovetailed with Indian independence, the IPTA remained a prominent medium of post-colonial theater. Pakistan emerged as a theocratic state where the leftist movement remained largely an underground activity under off and on military regimes. Hence the nation's tryst with theater has remained a protracted encore. But that, I guess, has to be another story for another day. And as it was institutionalized in the colonial metropolis, I'm going to sum up. Um, modern Indian theater appeared to epitomize the condi conditions of colonial dominance. It borrowed its organizational structures, textual features, and performance conventions from Europe, especially from England, superseded traditional and popular indigenous performance genres, and found its core audience among the growing English educated Indian middle class. I think Ibsen intervenes here. A European, but not an English playwright, he was a better choice than Shakespeare for the post colonial theater scene. His plays, especially the prose plays are products of a period of transition in Norway when many of the nationalist projects were underway. So the issues connected with the construction of identity in a liminal nationalist phase are there in his plays that the South Asian post-colonial nationalists found usable. And I will get to the details later with concrete examples. Mm. Thank you, Sabiha. That was a very important context that you um, provided us uh, for further discussion, which we, we know we will get to hear more about um, how Ibsen was adapted in these contexts. So now I want to turn back to um, Dr. McLaren and um, Africa. Um, we know li Ibsen lived in a context that is far away and vastly different from today's Zimbabwe. And yet you have successfully staged some of his plays there. How would you describe an so-called African encounter with Ibsen's works? In other words, why should African playmakers bother about Henry Gibson? 
Well, I think there's a very short answer to that. But before I, I, I do make, I make that short answer, I'd just like to say thank you very much to Sadi. Uh, that was really interesting. And it, that's precisely what I meant by the need for people from where I come from and her to talk because there are so many synergies and so many uh, similarities between uh, their struggle and our struggle. Um, just to something I, I never mentioned to you, uh, Sabia, was that when I was at Leeds uh, doing my doctorate, uh, I took part in a play, uh, Haivadan. Yes. By, I di directed by Anuradha Kapoor. Do you know her? Yes, I know her. I met her in Delhi. Absolutely. And she said she would be here today. So if she's here today, it would be great if she uh, revealed herself. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, yeah, thank you very, very much for that. And also uh, somebody uh, tweeted a little correction. And of course, obviously the Norwegians must have been involved if they were in that relationship with Denmark in slavery in Africa. Uh, of course, the, the castles are referred to as Danish castles, but at that time, as you have rightly pointed out, uh, the two of you are working hand in glove. Um, I, I think the, uh, the short answer to that one is I don't think many people would bother. And no, not, many, not many people in theater would bother. There's not many people have any idea who Ibsen is. Uh, certainly I can't answer for other African playmakers, um, but there are African playmakers who have worked uh, in Ibsen. It would be interesting to hear why they, they do it. Um, and to a large extent, we did hear that when we went uh, to, the, to Lusaka for the Ibsen in Africa uh, conference and festival, where a number of African directors and theatre groups were, were, were discussing precisely that. Um, I think one good reason for, for why we should be doing Ibsen's plays is that Ibsen, with his long hair and beard, looks just like Steve Chifunyese, the late playwright and cultural icon. Can we see them? Um, yes, can we see them? The, um, he was my partner and we developed Chipao together. Okay, all right, more seriously, you can go away. You can take that one away now. Liang, you can take it away, right. Uh, but seriously, the fact of unequal development uh, comes in here, uh, involving various regions and countries of the world. Uh, sometimes makes for stimulating and fertile literary and theatrical encounters. Uh, we first experienced this, uh, this unequal development between different societies and the way in which it opens up opportunities, unexpected opportunities to people working in theater. When we performed a Soviet play uh, by Nikolai Pogodin entitled Kremlin Chimes uh, at the University of Zimbabwe. Um, it was set in the years of the Civil War, when the, so the, the young Soviet Union was just fighting for its survival. Uh, as we know, 10 Western nations invaded, virtually every capitalist nation on the globe invaded to try and snuff out this uh, revolution. Um, when, when, we, when people from the uh, Soviet embassy came to see the performance, they were staggered as to why you're so interested in this. You know, for us, it's, uh, it's past history, you know, why, why would you want to do a play like that? They should have known that Zimbabwe had only recently won its independence. And just as in the years of the Bolshevik revolution, Zimbabwe was struggling to transform a backward economy a backward economy, uh, it's fine, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, to transform a backward ex, ex colony into a country in which the oppressed masses would at last have a better life. Now, the interesting thing is I played a part in that as the English historian and writer H.G. Wells uh, in a scene where Lenin was holding forth about the electrification of the countryside. And of course, with that typical English patronization and a sneer, H.G. Uh, Wells went away uh, and referred to him as the dreamer in the Kremlin, you might know that. But just as Lenin dreamt of bringing electricity uh, to the deprived masses, 
so Zimbabwe did too. Lenin's dream came true, and Zimbabwe's is not far from coming true, despite the difficulties put in her way by those who do not share them. The point there is that the experience of the Soviet Union, 70 years at that stage, 80 years ago, was something that was very close to us because we were, because of this uh, difference, time lag in, in, in our development, we felt very close. Now it's a similar uh, f uh, phenomenon uh, when you look at the way in which Africans approach Ibsen's plays. I mean, Ibsen lived and wrote in probably the most complacent and self-satisfied phase of European bourgeois society and culture. Ibsen was 23 when that iconic expression of English triumphalism, the great exhibition of the works of industry of all nations. Can we have that slide? Uh, took place in London. Can we have the slide? Yes, coming right up. Yeah. Uh, though Norway at that time, of course, was not as advanced, nevertheless, its middle classes uh, shared very similar values. Uh, the point is that Ibsen, the point is, that Ibsen interrogated those values. And I think this is just what uh, Sabiha was talking about. Ibsen as a, as a model uh, is different from, from, from many of the colonial models that, that we've, were foisted on Africa uh, because Ibsen interrogated those bourgeois values. Uh, virtually every, every play he wrote was uh, spit in the eye. He refused to accept these traditionally held bourgeois beliefs and prejudices, but rather challenged them. Now, this was to be, to, this was to be the key to our engagement with Ibsen, and possi possibly one for Africa too. This is our link with Ibsen. Africa, in many ways, because of uneven development, is probably more like Norway was then than modern Norway is now. As a result, Ibsen's Norway is in many ways, in many ways did not feel strange to Zimbabweans. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Robert. Yes, now, um, after we've heard about these two different contexts or several different contexts presented by Professor Hagen, and Dr. McLaren, I want to turn back to Sabiha again and um, um, ask you to give us some examples, concrete examples of how Ibsen has been um, performed. Because I know your research, you're, you have researched extensively on Ibsen in South, South Asia, and it is a big topic, but can you try to give us some examples and to show us um, in those contexts, how, how Ibsen has been uh, performed? Uh, yes, Liang, thank you. But I, I will be needing my slides again. Yes. Um, and uh, just to uh, uh, connect my, what I was connect to what I, I was saying earlier, uh, since the early 1950s, uh, new forms of literary drama and experimental performances have appeared on an unprecedented scale in more than a dozen Indian languages mainly in metropolitan and urban locations. The historical origins of this evolving tradition of texts and performance practices lie in the genres, discourses, and institutions of theatrical modernity that emerged under European influence in colonial cities as Calcutta and Bombay during the second half of the 19th century. And here, this uh, theoretical a uh, point of departure is needed because, you know, what Darvatkar writes here uh, are not only a point, they, they don't, don't only point to a Marxist understanding of cultural performance vis-a-vis -vis new nationhood, but in the present context, it is important to understand that these are the basic underpinnings of the Ibsen canon in South Asia. And I have already said that South Asian post-colonial nationalists found Ibsen usable, but they used him tactfully because the factors mentioned in this uh, comment needed to be integrated. The, comment, the uh, red uh, uh, colored text here are these factors. Uh, so they needed to reinstate a free identity by glorifying the pre-colonial self and at the same time, 
needed to locate the flip side of the post-colonial identity that was looming large with its grave social, economic, and ethical issues. So they borrowed material from the colonizers to address the issues, but used those on their own terms. And here, the best Ibsenian example I can draw upon is Shombhu Mitra's Putul Khela, the adaptation of a doll's house in 1958. Mitra was eager to present new Bhadralok or gentleman and Bhadra Mohila or lady in the urban educated middle class that was struggling to integrate with the new, uh, newly achieved post-colonial modernity, if we want to term it as. But at the same time, he wanted to create a theater that would draw elements from traditional Indian theater. That is obvious from Mitra's comments. And so I find Mitra using a lot of the idea of rasa, uh, the <clears throat> theory uh, Bharata introduced in the Nakta Shastra, or human emotion propagated by Bharata in, in the, his book. Among the nine rasas he has used almost all, I'm talking about Mitra. Mitra has used almost all. Ibsen's protagonist, Nora, becomes Bulu in this adaptation and her different moods in the play display all these emotions. When she is preparing for the Durga Puja, humming, flirting with her husband and his male friend and contemplating on her past, facing an enraged, enraged uh, angered husband uh, and, and um, reciting poetry and finally deciding to move out she enacts all these rasas. And here we have her image. Could you go to the image, please, Liang? Uh, <clears throat> the image is from uh, the next slide, Liang. Yes, this one, thank you. Here we have Im I her image when she was reciting a poem. And this image tells of diverse emotions. At the back of her mind, there is fear of revelation and conflict. And at the same time, she is indulging in love and hope and contemplating disaster and death too. The Tagore poem Mitra uses as a substitute of Tarantula for the Bengali audience is significant. Uh, I will recite the Bengali lines that would give us the idea how intimately Mitra projected Tagore into the play. Ami, পরানের সাথে খেলিব আজিকে মরণ খেলা নিশিত বেলা সঘন বরসা গগন আধার হ্যার বাড়ি ধারে কাঁদে চারিধার ভীষণ রঙে ভব তরঙ্গে ভাষায় ভেলা বাহির হয়েছি স্বপ্ন শয়ন করিয়া হেলা রাত্রি বেলা দিস পোয়েম expresses the pain of the deadly bite of the spider that would force the woman to fall into a fit in which she was plagued by heightened excitability and restlessness and would eventually succumb to death. The woman's position in the domestic and the national space becomes Mitra's concern and he showed the hypocrisy of the urban educated class that claimed modernity but was still mired in a retrogressive mindset, that proverbial home and world dichotomy. So a similar but uh, macro level hypocrisy of statism, uh, the next slide please, Liang, is brought out by Rustam Barucha in his Pirgind in 1995, but I will not uh, go to that now. Uh, I will come to uh, the woman question. And I must refer to the plays adapted in Bangladesh in the 1990s, when the country was going through a phase of gender sensitization. If you remember, there were a lot of activities regarding women's empowerment in the world during the 1990s, including the World Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995. You must have been very young, Liang. 
Kamaluddin Nilu directed Ghosts in 1996 <clears throat> and A Doll's House, the next one is from his Doll's House in 2001 to show the Bangladeshi women's predicament. And religion was a crucial issue in a post-colonial Indian subcontinent as the partition in 1947 could materialize because of religious division. So Barucha's fair game in Mysore in 1995 will be a stronger example to which I'll come later. But at this point, I need to say about Brand that Nilu directed in Bangladesh in 2004, relating to the event of demolition of the murals of Baul singers in Dhaka city by fanatics. These are images from Brand. <clears throat> Uh, so Nilu claims that he found Ibsen highly relevant in that context. In 2020, when a furor rages in Bangladesh over the vandalizing of a statue of the father of the nation, one realizes anew the validity of Nilu's observations and thereby the currency that Ibsenism could hold not just in a decolonized South Asian perspective, but also specifically in the case of a relatively new nation that has an upward GDP, but where the body politic is still mired in the narrative of invisibilization when it comes to the question of intolerance over opposed ideologies. The bigger question that Ibsenism could perhaps address is whether there is an ideology to moot in the first place. If if, you, if that answers your question, Liang. Yeah. Thank you, Sabiha. Um, since we're on these um, concrete ex examples, I know, Robert, you have adapted um, both Pirgind and the Doll's House, Doll's House actually twice. Um, would you like to tell us a bit more about your experience adapting Pirgind? Because um, this is a fascinating play, which we all would agree has a lot of Norwegian elements in it. It's full of uh, references to Norwegian folklore and yet it has been successfully adapted around the world in many, many different cultures, cultures that are very far away from Norway. Um, how did you uh, treat uh, these elements in, in your adaptation of Pekint? It was in 2006, right? Yeah, well, I think I think we really had no, very few problems with it because for two reasons: one, in terms of the content, uh, and and the other, in terms of the form. Um, Ibsen's Norway was rather like Zimbabwe is now. Uh, there are peers in every village, and mothers despair over their fecklessness, weddings with lots of dance eloping, the young men going to the big city or into down to South Africa, striking it lucky, coming back, losing everything. I mean, so much. Then there was the supernatural world as well. I'm moving quite fast now because I see we're moving, uh, uh, running out of time. Um, the world of the supernatural was very, very, very close to us and no problems. Um, we don't have trolls, but in Zimbabwe, we have Mashavi, the lost spirits who roam the land looking for someone to inhabit. Uh, there is the Njuzu, the water spirit, uh, like mermaids who live in pools and can abduct people and take them down into the water to a land of green grass and lots of fat cattle. There, there are no button molders. Are you managing to get the slides uh, that go with this? Uh, you need to move quite fast. Um, let's just catch up with the slides a bit. Which ones do you want me to show? Yeah, well, there's uh, Peter's mother berating her son next. Uh, yeah, that's um, the death of the mother. This is a Shavi, the Shavi queen. Uh, let's go fast, uh, Leah. We don't have button molders, but we've got uh, homemakers. And of course, uh, we have a, a, a faithful Sichle waiting for uh, Peter, uh, Peter, uh, Peter, he was named Peter Gwindi uh, to come back. Um, so in terms of the, of the, of the um, content, we had no problems. In, secondly, in terms of form, 
Um, although the prevalent form of theater at that time in Europe was naturalism and, and uh, uh, realism, um, and now in, 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 South, in, in Africa, um, this has been become the case because of the result of globalization and colonialism. Uh, in fact, essentially, it, essentially realism is alien to Africa. For centuries and centuries in the pre-colonial years, African artists seldom produced art that copied nature. They didn't see the point. So in terms of form, the play's non-realist, I'm now talking about uh, 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 Pierre Gint, the form of the play's non-realist narrative and picaresque uh, form con conforms very nicely with what I call African non-realism. There are lots of African plays. Here's one you're seeing a picture from, Credo Mutwas Unos Limela. This is the, 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 one of the great gods of Africa, Umvelengangi, uh, who play, who, who plays a part in this in the play? Uh, the, the number of others: Ozidi by J. P. Clarke, Umuntu by 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 um, Joe de Graft. Um, based on narrative, these plays have many different episodes in many different places at many at many different times. Lots of characters, supernatural or unreal events, music and dance. So, in in terms of that, uh, we were at home. It was our territory. Um, as for the play's theme, we called our African version Pierre Gint. We called it A Journey to Yourself. Everywhere in the world, during their lives, human beings have grappled with the world's temptations and allurements and ended up not knowing themselves, not knowing their own selves. So why not Africa? So that uh, very briefly, just to say that also uh, some piano accordionists, classical piano accordionists came to Africa, uh, to Zimbabwe, and they, uh, they did a performance and the actors acted and danced uh, with it. And that was great because um, the African, African audiences for the first time came to know Greek and what his music was about and realized that it's actually possible to like European classical music. I say European because African classical music is said to have originated in the Mali Empire at the time of Sundiata. So that very briefly, Liang, is uh, something about uh, Pierre Gint. Thank you, Robert. Um, now, speaking of Pierre Gint, I know, uh, Sabiha, you wrote your whole doctoral dissertation on Pierre Gint, uh, both South Asian versions and a Norwegian version. So um, would you like to tell us how Pierre Gint has been localized in South Asia to build or reinforce national identities in different cultural contexts? Uh, yes, Liang, thank you for this question. Um, but before I answer this, I must congratulate Robert for his adaptation of Pirgin. That is a fabulous play, Robert, what you have done with Pirgin. I, I am in love with it, I must say. And coming to um, my research of Pirgin, I was actually curious when I read Rustam Barucha's comment um, that he found the character Pirgint always already Indian. He adapted the play in 1995, keeping in mind the event of the Babri Mosque demolition in 1992. Liang, could you please uh, show us the comment of Barucha, which I have yes. in my first slide? Mm -hmm. uh, getting the <laughs> slide up. Yes, I got it. Yes, this one. So I was kind of intrigued by Barucha, and <clears throat> I feel that this is an aftermath of 200 years of colonial rule that stood its ground on divide and rule policy. So the religious bigotry that Barucha wanted to critique through this play was directly a post-colonial reaction to the colonial teaching. So once again, if one casts a look at the state of polity in India in the present time, judicial uh, pronouncements on the Babri demolition, which has happened this year, the questions that arise on the state of institutions in the largest democracy and the apprehensions of an intolerant nation looming large in South Asia, one witnesses the same metaphoric realization of an Ibsenian interrogation of the pillars of society. So <clears throat> Barucha's 
apprehensions, but it is pegged, which on the one hand resists uh, any broad homogenization of the nation, and on the other, integrates ideas of Gandhi and Swaraj. Liam, could you please change the slide? Liam, are you there? Yeah, the slide has been changed to the images of uh, 1995. Yeah, that, yeah. This one, this one, thank you. So, uh, so Barucha here uh, resists broad homogenize, homogenization of the nation uh, by referring to uh, intracultural. And <clears throat> on the other hand, he integrates ideas of Swaraj and tolerance and assimilation of different religious faiths. And it calls for renewed understandings. The image of the spinning wheel here says it all. And to talk more on Pierre Gint in post-colonial South Asian adaptations, I will refer to Kamaluddin Nilu, who also adapted the text in 2000 in Dhaka. Apart from depicting the post-colonial Bengal as a mother, which this image which will tell us, the play uses Bengali folklore the next one uh, is uh, for that. I, and I find a lot of millennial development goals or MDGs integrated into this adaptation. For example, uh, the following, the next image here. I think there is a little bit of a lag, so you can keep talking because I see the next yeah. one. Okay, okay. So this image, uh, the awareness against deforestation is created through human bodies acting as trees. Bangladesh, as a new and developing country, prioritized its millennium goals, and this play tried to capture much of it simultaneously with Ibsen's idea of narrow nationalism that harms any reconstructive step on the national level. Uh, these two, I, I will refer to for the time being. Okay, thank you so much, Sabiha. Now, um, Robert, would you like to talk a bit about your um, adaptation of A Doll's House, The Most Wonderful Thing of All, or shall we uh, take a break and then we come back and we talk about uh, the whole project that you uh, had, when, which won the Ibsen Scholarship in 2011, which I think includes The Most Wonderful Thing of All. Yeah, let, let me let me do that one quickly. Okay. So that after the break uh, we can look at the issues. Yes. So so we'll we'll have uh, Dr. McLaren tell us more about his adaptation of uh, Doll's House. Okay. All right. Thank thank you very much, uh, Sabiha. Um, I, that last slide was very interesting because that's exactly the scope that that play gave us to do things like that, to work with the body, to get away from the realism. Uh, and it looked very much like a scene that we also did, you know, when, uh, all right, we won't go into that, but um, that's the kind of opportunities that uh, it, that play gives you. Now, in terms of our, our Ibsen uh, project, um, of course, there are lots of, we have lots of uh, problems in Africa, as you know, some of them caused by, uh, forces from outside, some caused by us ourselves. Uh, but the point is that there are a lot of people really trying to do something uh, to, to put them right. And this is never uh, really emphasized. There are a lot of people trying to make things happen to, to solve those problems. So we felt as people in theater, we would want to uh, participate in that. Um, and so we, the idea came um, to to, to come up with this project, interrogating Ibsen in Southern Africa. Uh, and we were given an Ibsen award for it. Basically what it was, was that uh, in the first phase, uh, some young actors would come from South Africa, uh, from Namibia and from uh, Zimbabwe. And then they would work together in an Ibsen camp for one, for one week or just a little bit over one week. And they would interrogate um, Ibsen plays. Now we had already done the interrogation of a doll's house. So that play was ready, which meant that the Zimbabwean actors, young actors were able to 
integrate themselves with the Namibians and with the uh, South Africans and, 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 and participate because they'd gone through the process. So the Namibians worked on um, ghosts and the South Africans worked on enemy of the people. The next phase was meant to be that they would go back to their countries with these plays, uh, perform them in a, 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 a playhouse in, 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 the, in the capital or something like that, and then go out into the countryside and take the play to young people and discuss the issues, because that was the whole point. Um, the, last, the last phase was then after that, after that process, uh, we would come together and we would have a kind of convention or a kind of a, a, a function where we would invite important stakeholders in the community across the, across the, the line. I mean, religious leaders, government, uh, corporate sector, etc. And in the evenings, these plays would be performed. And the next day, these people involved in development would take these issues and, and, and discuss them. And this is the way that we thought that Ibsen could work. And we really felt that it, 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 Ibsen has the ability to, to deal with these issues and make us think about those issues. Unfortunately, the, 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 the second one only happened, the second phase only happened with Zimbabwe, where the Zimbabweans took their play, uh, the most wonderful thing of all, based on, uh, on a doll's house around the country, and they did that and had wonderful discussions. Uh, South Africa and, and Namibia, they didn't get the funding, unfortunately. And of course, it meant that the last, uh, the last uh, phase uh, was not possible. But just to say that when they performed those plays, after one week, it was just incredible. After one week, they were so powerful that the Norwegian ambassador who was present, Inge Bjorg uh, Stoffering, commented, that if anyone doubted the power of theater to promote social change, the draft plays would have convinced them. And what I can add here is if anyone doubts the power of Ibsen, even in Africa, to promote social change, then these plays would have convinced you. Thank you, Leah. Thank you so much, Robert. And um, we will get to hear more about how these young actors use Ibsen to promote social changes in uh, right after the break. I think interesting discussion before the break. And I want to just continue with what Robert was saying about this uh, wonderful project called the Ibsen Camp, where these young actors got together and wrote drafts for their versions of three Ibsen plays. Um, would you like to tell us more about these other two plays? Um, and then, uh, then I'll turn to Sabiha for, for our last question before we open up to the audience for questions. Got me? Yes. All right, yeah. All right, very, very quickly again, because I know that uh, time is of the essence. Uh, first of all, before I actually get back to the camp, just to say that the process of, of making uh, the, the other play, uh, the most wonderful thing of all, uh, needs to, I need to say one or two things about that before we get on to the other things. Um, we did a production of a Doll's House. It was a realist production of Doll's House. And I, I felt that um, if we were to unpack this play, we needed to unpack uh, the, the form as well. And, and this is what African non-realism gives us, the ability to, to be free with the play and do what we want to make it work as theater, but at the same time, find other ways of getting meaning across. So basically we used uh, a number of different uh, approaches. One was a, a series of flashbacks uh, where, you know, to the play itself. The other one was scenes in which unre unrealistic, non-realistic scenes where people in the community, family members, uh, even the, the maids, at, at, you saw this picture here, these are the maids discussing it in the supermarket while they do their, their shopping. Uh, people, the, the, the pastor, uh, family members, etc., all discussing the central question that the whole play was based on. What would happen in Zimbabwe if a woman did what Nora did. Uh, and then we had images where we tried to find essential uh, meanings, which would be more powerfully communicated uh, through 
physical theater through through dance etc cetera, etc cetera. and then finally as with any um, African play and uh, we saw that even in India as well especially in the beginning uh, music and dance uh, was very important uh, the, the play the play the responses to the play when they took the play around the, the, the countryside what the feeling first of all there was a there was a, a unanimity that uh, leaving the children uh, was not acceptable um, also, uh, her, in, her intransigence relating to the marriage was also questioned, sort of surely she, she could have given him, him some more time, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we, 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 had a, we had a lot of discussion about the whole question of Tongoana. I mean, there was a feeling that if, if the woman's cause is to succeed, it won't succeed if men are always depicted as unable to learn and improve. And here was Tongo Ona, who really loved her, and as we as we depicted, uh, had a lot to learn. His love, that kind of love he had before, needed to change. He had a lot to learn, but he did change. So at the end of the play, it is suggested that they will come back together again, not an ending that European feminists might approve of, but one which harmonizes with what in Southern Africa we call Ubuntu or Hunu, the quality of being human. Now, when it comes to the enemy of the people, that's one of the two plays that was made. These were young actors and actresses looking at Ibsen's play in the light of the new South Africa. They themselves knew nothing about apartheid, but they had to deal with the toxic legacy of apartheid in a situation where making the changes uh, is, is, is very difficult. Um, they had to deal with a society in which the formerly oppressed, powerless and hard up now had access to power and the possibility of wealth. And as some comrades uh, you know, from the struggle said, that we didn't go into the bush uh, in order to be poor. So it was seen as an opportunity to enrich themselves. So the play spoke to the youth uh, who had not known apartheid uh, and they noticed the tendency of self-interest to outweigh conscience and the collusion of the bureaucratic bourgeoisie that's the former nationalist revolutionaries who controlled government and the bourgeoisie, the white, white capital, which still controls the economy and the petty bourgeoisie now made up of white and assimilated black dependents and servants of their, in, in, their, of their interests. Um, and at the bottom of it all, the relations of self in, in, enrichment and bribery, corruption and graft just as Dr. Stockman's life-saving discovery concerning the water of the baths is rejected because of how it impacts on people's selfish interests. So in South Africa, those charged with building the new South Africa, the new democratic South Africa, all steal with no pang of conscience as to its negative effects. And they brought out this incredibly strongly. Now, when it comes to ghosts, this, I found this was the most extraordinary play. And I, I really can't, I can't credit that in five days, they put a play like a, a, a play of such subtlety and, and force. And the way in which they took uh, ghosts and very, very sophisticatedly uh, used it, but not in a literal sense, but you'll see from what I've got to say, how they did it. Um, outside the premises where we worked, which is actually a scout hall, Chapal premises. There was a large wild fig tree. Um, one of those, one of the fig trees called Monde. The Namibians did all their creative sessions at the foot of this fine tree. So it wasn't surprising that it influenced them and they built their play around it and called it the tree of ghosts. Um, the tree came to have a symbolic role rather like that of the orphanage in, in ghosts the ghosts, the old ideas that people still cling to, inherited from the past, which wrap themselves around uh, people's lives like spider webs, were visualized as the branches and the shadows of the tree. Whenever in the play such an idea intruded its dead weight of unthinking tradition into the lives of the characters, a branch was lopped off or falls from the tree in a storm. Um, these old ideas relate to a number of social conventions. Again, like the, the orphanage, one is toxic marriages in the house, but respectability in the community. 
where the former must be endured for the sake of the latter. If this was all, it would not be much very remarkable, but it's not. The, the plot of the play begins with the funeral of that respectable pillar of the community, Kambunga, and the arrival of a young man, Mubasan, the Oswald character. Kambunga's wife is Neepo, the Mrs. Alvin character. She was a combatant in Namibia's War of Independence. During that time, in one of the Swapo camps, she gives birth to a baby boy. The boy is taken from her and like all the war babies, sent to school in various countries, invariably in Europe. In the case of Nehepo's boy, he's brought up in, in Germany. Now, just like Oswald, who pitches up from Paris, Mubasan brings with him from Germany very different ideas from those of his mother and her people. To all intents and purposes, he's a German, not a Namibian. They actually say that to him. He has come to find his mother, he is about to get married, and he has come to get his mother's blessings. The young man has grown up free from Namibian ghosts. He knows nothing about the importance, for instance, of Lobola. He comes, he comes to get married, but he doesn't even know uh, that he can't do that without Lobola, without Bridewells. In one sense, he seems to be a catalyst for truth. But again, it's not that simple. When he tells his mother he is to get married, like any African mother, Nehepo ululates and dances with joy. Then she says, when will they be able to see her? She means the bride. Mubasan says, he will not be able to come to Namibia. Now, this is a common problem in, in Bantu languages, mixing up he and she because gender is not differentiated. She laughs at him thinking he's made a mistake and says, ha, you must mean she, don't you? He replies that he is marrying a German. His name, his name is Klaus. To Neherpa's horror, she discovers that Mubasan, her son, is in love and is about to marry a man. This is, of course, a shocker in the Namibian context and runs diametrically opposite to the values nurtured by the traditions of the tree. Mubasan tells her he is free to marry whom he wishes. He loves Klaus. Then, a very inappropriate question to ask your mother, but he doesn't know that. He asks, did you love your late husband? Kambunga. It turns out that her marriage to Kambunga was an arranged marriage for a start. She never loved him. In fact, like Captain Alving, this respectable pillar of the community made her life hell. Coming home after spending nights with other women, forcing her to have unprotected sex, and even threatening her with a gun if she refused. It was all hushed up, but the truth was he died of AIDS. In Elizabethan symbolism, the pox or syphilis was often referred to as fire, conjuring up the fire at the orphanage. It would appear so far that Mubasan has forced the characters and the audience to think freshly about their own culture and values, and that the Namibian tree is all wrong and casts a negative uh, shadow over the characters' lives. In fact, at the end of the play, Nehepo resolves to chop it down and free their lives from its shadow. But as in the case of Nora's behavior, so the Namibians do not accept completely what the Germans have to tell them about their culture and values. This is where a very important character comes in, Matrone. Matrone is an old woman, a seer, a repository of traditional wisdom. She stops Nehepo from cutting down the tree, rebuking her by saying that the tree of old ideas and traditions is also the tree of the ancestors, the tree of the people of Namibia. Let me tell you, she says, you cannot uproot this tree, for it is the tree of our people. You may try, but you will fail, and then you will see where these old branches were. They will grow new ones, green among the brown, innocent amongst the guilty. For it is still our tree, the tree of life, the tree of truth, and yes, the tree of lies. The tree is us, the tree is our people. The concept of freedom that Mubasan 
seems to bring to Namibian society. It's also interrogated against the concept of freedom the comrades fought for against South African colonialism. Matrone points out that Mobasan's apparent freedom is a lonely, individualistic freedom. That of the Namibian people is the freedom of a people. As is often happens in African theater, the play ends with singing, dancing, and celebrating, where even the audience joins in and takes possession of the stage. Ah, Sibamba, de Sibe Moya Munye, Sakum Shaba, where to Sfanana Majuba. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robert. This was a wonderful play. Um, thank you for sharing it with us. And we hope one day we'll see a full version of it somewhere. Um, so now, Sabiha, you told me about an exciting book project you have been working on, um, which has to do with Ibsen and decolonization. Can you tell us more about that project? Um, well, this is a work in progress, as you know. Um, I have worked on numerous Ibsen adaptations in this part of the globe, but I have not looked at many others as seriously. So post-colonialism has always been my interest, and I believe there is no affix as post to go with colonialism, as it always remained as neo-colonialism or in some other form, as Robert mentioned in the beginning. Uh, now I'm trying to include in my book the productions that I feel are important as part of this post-colonial project, or may I say works that interrogate on how post uh, the post-colonial is really. So uh, the ever new forms it takes will also be explored. I want to include productions from Sri Lanka and Pakistan um, that never came into my discussion uh, on South Asia before, because I am yet to traverse these terrains. Mm, let's see how it goes. <laughs> That's all I can say at the moment. Mm. Yeah, it sounds like a really exciting project and you're including more um, cultures in the uh, South Asian context. So I really look forward to that and good luck with um, writing the book.